Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the book webinar series on distinguished books in political science. The book webinar is a new project organized by the Korean Association of International Studies this year. We have just successfully completed the very first book seminar last month. And today we have the second seminar of the series sponsored by uh, East Asia Institute. Uh, by the way, I'm Jung Juyan at Korea University, uh, the moderator of today's webinar. Let me introduce today's participants to the audience. Uh, first of all, I'm excited that we have Professor Stefan Haggard as the presenter today. I don't think that we need a long introduction for him since Korean scholars are very familiar with his works. But uh, to briefly introduce him to the audience, Professor Haggard is uh, the Lawrence and Sally Krauss Professor of Korea Pacific Studies and the director of the Korea Pacific Program at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at uh, UC San Diego. As we well know uh, already, he has extensively researched and written on North Korea, transitions to and from democracy, and East Asian economic development. Um, today, he'll be presenting his most recent book titled Backsliding, um, this book um, published in 2021 by Cambridge University Press. Uh, we also have invited three specialists on democracy and authoritarian regimes as discussants. First of all, Professor Joon Bin at Sungkyunkwan University, Professor Kim Nam Gyu at Korea University, and Professor Nam Yoon Min at Gongju National University. Um, just to explain you uh, how we will proceed today, uh, I will first ask Professor Hager to present on his book for about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, and then ask each of the discussants to make comments for about 10 minutes each, um, and then get back to Professor Hager for his answers. And then if there is any remaining time, uh, we will have further discussion, hopefully uh, including uh, Korea as well. Um, now, without further ado, uh, let us welcome today's presenter, uh, Professor Hagert. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Julian, for for hosting this. I, I really, it's uh, it's great to see so many old friends and some unexpected ones as well. Uh, Chan Jae Song, I didn't know that he was going to be joining us as well, and I'm very happy for the involvement of the East Asia Institute. Um, if you'll permit me, I'm going to share my, um, my screen, and I hope people can see this. And is everyone seeing that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. So um, let me just give a little background on, on this project. Um, I started a, a project with Robert Kaufman, my colleague at Rutgers. We've written um, three books together and edited another one on, on the concept of uh, transition, on the concept of transitions to and from democratic rule that came out as dictators and democrats in 2016. And this was looking at the effect of theories of inequality and regime change, um, particularly theories advanced by Asimov and Robinson and Bloch. And we were interested in, in looking at those but then in the course of doing that book, we started to look at cases um, uh, that, that were outside of the developing world, that were outside of transitions to outright uh, authoritarianism, including most notably the United States. And we wrote this piece in Perspectives on Politics called Democratic Decline in the United States, what we, what we can learn from middle income countries and it was that uh, project which ultimately got us into uh, this uh, short book for Cambridge and the Element series on uh, backsliding. So um, backsliding, and we, we started a conversation on this, um, has a very particular meaning. This is not any transition to authoritarian rule, and it's not an authoritarian country becoming more authoritarian. Um, it's, it's a type of democratic regress in, uh, that involves the incremental erosion of democratic institutions, rules, and norms, but undertaken by a government which is itself duly and fairly elected. 
So this is this is an important point. You know, this is not a theory about about what happens in in regimes that are already authoritarian, and it's not about coups, which dominated transitions to authoritarian rule in the post-war period. It's about a process which we call purposeful institutional change in which elected incumbents are seeking uh, to weaken uh, democratic rule and particularly the three core components of it that we define as the existence of horizontal checks, that is the classic conception of, of checks and balances of government, what we call the collapse of the separation of powers, political rights and civil liberties, including media freedom, which is quite, quite consequential, as we'll see. And then ultimately, the integrity of the electoral system, the idea that elections can be counted on by publics to be free and fair. And I want to emphasize an important point, because I think it's an open question. And that is, uh, that backsliding may or may not result in reversion to outright authoritarian rule. In other words, you can have an incremental erosion in the quality of democracy without a country necessarily becoming authoritarian, uh, which we can define in terms of the chances or likelihood of opposition seizing powers basically dropping to zero. So um, on on the process, the way we proceeded was, was really empirical in large part. We wanted to first identify cases that fit this concept empirically. And so we selected on the outcome um, uh, variable, and, and we can talk about the method here in more detail. We looked at the period from 1974 to 2017, and we basically set a threshold of crossing a certain standard using VDEM, the VDEM Electoral Democracy Index. And the idea of having eight years above this threshold was we wanted to capture democracies that had consolidated to some extent. So we weren't just interested in, in countries that had been de democratic for a very short time, but those who had crossed some threshold for some meaningful period of time. And then backsliding is, is defined as an episode during which liberal democracy scores, which capture some of these core features of democracy that I talked about, fell significantly below their peak. So, so we're trying to capture a phenomena where a country has achieved a certain level of democracy, it may be a democracy over a very long period like the United States, or more recently like Poland, and then it experiences a drop. And then we also tried to triangulate that with some other um, indicators, some other data sets to make sure that our choices weren't idiosyncratic. And the cases that emerged were somewhat surprising to us. I mean, they're a very heterogeneous group of countries. Um, some in, in the Andes, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, Venezuela, of course, is very well known as a kind of pioneer of backsliding. Hungary, Poland are also well known. Uh, Turkey is a classic case that everyone knows. But there were some less well known cases as well, such as the Dominican Republic. Um, Serbia, Ukraine, and also, of course, more recently, uh, sadly, Brazil has joined that list, um, particularly under uh, Bolsonaro. So the method that we undertook was in part to undertake a comparative analysis of these cases against regional benchmarks. So we were interested in looking at causal factors that might differentiate them from countries in their region. Um, and so, for example, we would consider indicators such as polarization. You know, this is, these are measures. I'm just showing these measures of polarization in Brazil and ask questions, is this country more polarized than its regional comparators? But most of the work in the book was done um, by what we call within case causal inference. Uh, of a postulated causal sequence in which we did extensive case studies of each of these 16 
And those case studies, by the way, are posted online in an appendix to the book, which runs to several hundred pages. And actually, a former student of mine, Inbuk Rhee, who is currently at the KDI school, um, played a big role in, in helping us with this. And, and that, um, that um, appendix both provides some of the quantitative data that we use to identify these episodes. So for example, these are our 16 cases and showing exactly when they, they recede, including in the United States. Many of these, as you can see, are quite recent. And then this is an example of the type of case material which we provide to validate our judgments about some of the underlying causes of, of uh, this backsliding process. So basically, um, we, we have in the book what I call a causal mechanism figure. I'm a big fan of these. Anyone who's not doing a formal game theoretic model um, should probably consider in, in their books and articles to, to um, uh, give this kind of, uh, provide this kind of causal mechanism figure. But our basic intuitions uh, were to focus on three uh, you know, underlying causal factors. One was the existence of political polarization, which we saw as a quite um, significant feature of all of these backsliding episodes. But I, probably the, and this is, this is widely noted in the literature on backsliding, I think this idea of polarization, but probably one of our contributions to an understanding of backsliding is our focus on the role that's played by legislatures. Because executives, whether in parliamentary systems or presidents, obviously inherit a lot of powers on coming to office. There's lots that they can do by themselves, often invoking or using or pushing the envelope of powers which they have as chief executives. But it's often the legislature, which is quite crucial to delegating powers uh, to the executive or simply faltering on their exer exercise of oversight powers. And so the executive um, isn't doing this alone, but is typically doing this uh, with support of legislative coalitions. And we take that up in chapter three and then in chapter four, we talk about the incremental nature of the process, which as I'll explain also we think has causal effect. So let me just go through each of these quickly. Um, so on polarization, one point I wanna make clear is that Bob and I are agnostic on the ultimate sources of polarization. Because if you look at this list of countries, one of the things that's striking is that some backsliding cases backslide from the left, so to speak, for example, of Venezuela, Nicaragua, um, the Latin American cases, actually, Ecuador and Bolivia as well, and, um, and other cases outside Latin America, like Greece, uh, and arguably the United States were clearly affected by socioeconomic inequality, so polarization having this kind of economic foundation. But then a number of countries polarized from the right around ethnic, racial, religious, or tribal um, uh, commitments. And of course, we have this broader phenomena of cultural resentments um, that we see both in the United States and in a number of the post-communist cases where the main axis of polarization is in part between uh, cosmopolitan and nationalist ideologies. But for our purposes, the, these sources of polarization are less significant than what happens to the polity, both to elites and publics uh, in polarization, which is this creation or this emergence, this process by which uh, political adversaries, opponents come to see each other in these us them binaries in which pol uh, polarization actually becomes an issue of affect or even identity. And those of you who um, have, have followed the work on effective polarization in the United States know that in the United States right now, 
you know, if you're a Democrat, Republicans are just treated as a kind of other and vice versa. And, and this kind of effective polarization uh, kicks in, which has a number of adverse effects, we think, for democratic rule. So three effects of polarization in particular um, uh, attracted our attention. First, it, it can contribute directly to government dysfunction. Um, a polarized parties, a polarized uh, polities uh, find it difficult to act collectively uh, because it's difficult to reach agreement, which in turn undermines faith in political institutions more broadly. And so there's a reservoir of distrust of institutions that comes from polarization. By definition, polarization weakens the center and incentivizes anti-system and populist appeals that demonize oppositions. And, and what we see in most of these backsliding cases um, is a resurgence of what we call majoritarian, or for those of you who are political theorists might know as Republican conceptions of democracy. And these are conceptions of democracy which place much less emphasis on rights and checks and much more emphasis on the right of majorities to rule. And what we argue is that in these kind of polarized settings, these factors kind of combine to incentivize acquiescence to bad elite behavior. They, they incentivize acquiescence to bad elite behavior. And what I mean by that is captured in this very nice formal model by Milan Sfolik, in which he points out that if you believe that your political adversary is really an enemy who is going to be destructive of the polity, then you will support the actions of your guy, whatever those might be to prevent that from happening. And that kind of uh, effect of polarization, of generating support for anti-democratic actions is really in some ways the starting point uh, of the backsliding process. The fact that you would be willing to tolerate um, this kind of behavior because you believe that the alternatives are so much worse. Now, uh, the point about legislatures, I think can be stated very simply. There's an irony here because, um, of course, autocratic control of legislatures can weaken the very power of the legislature. And, and so there's an, a kind of irony that, that legislatures would be complicit in this process. But in the chapters that deal with the legislature, we show how legislative coalitions are quite crucial to the backsliding process. And we talk about how uh, the autocrats come con to control legislatures. Uh, in Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, the autocrats just simply formed parallel constitutive assemblies. In some cases, the, the electoral process, there's a kind of collective failure of oppositions to check an autocrat. Uh, you know, in an odd way, the Israeli um, the case is very interesting here. I mean, you know, Netanyahu has benefited from the fact that it's been very difficult for oppositions to form against him. And you see the tremendous coordination difficulties of challenging a potential autocrat. I mean, there's an eight party coalition now, which is finally formed in Israel uh, to get rid of Netanyahu, but, the, but it's a very fragile coalition. So it's, it's difficult to stop these movements. Um, and then we find that disproportionality actually is quite significant, that many of these systems, it's not that the, that the autocrats enjoy um, majority or super majority support, but they benefit from disproportional electoral systems, which both the United States and Korea have, by the way. And as you know, in the United States, it's the uh, electoral college, which, which allowed President Trump to be elected, the popular vote went uh, against him by a quite significant margin in, in, 20, um, in 2016. So um, what do legislatures do? Well, first of all, 
Um, they they uh, give up on oversight. They abandon their oversight function. Um, they support appointments to the judiciary and the executive branch, which basically uh, ensconce the uh, cronies of the autocrat. So the appointment function is quite important. And then we also find that they can delegate powers outright to the executive. Um, and, and we see in, in places like Turkey where constitutional amendments result in a, in a, in a parliamentary system actually being um, transformed into a presidential system and Erdogan's power is being quite significantly increased as a result of constitutional amendments. Um, and obviously a, a common feature of these backsliding cases is the relaxation of term limits. This comes up in a number of these cases. So not only do autocrats have more power, but they're granted the, the authority to exercise that power over much longer time horizons. And at the extreme, we have people like Chavez, who is in power for a dozen years, Putin and Erdogan going on 20 years now. So legislatures play a role in delegating those powers and extending presidential term. Now, the last uh, stage in this process, um, which we found interesting, and I think there's a lot of potential here for experimental and other types of work to, to push this along, is the fact that, that um, backsliding occurs incrementally. This is not like a coup. It's not as if all at once the political system is fundamentally transformed. You don't have a general standing in front of a bank of microphones announcing you know, a change in government, for example, as happened in Thailand. Uh, this, is, this is democratic regress by stealth, as Adam Shaworski put it. And, and what we argue in the book is that this incremental nature of backsliding itself has causal effect. It has causal effect because first, the components of democratic rule are mutually constitutive. So if I attack and can control the courts, for example, if I can weaken the independence of the courts, then one of the effects of that is I can use the courts to go after my political opponents and reduce their civil liberties. I can, I can attack the integrity of the electoral system. So, so these core components of democracy are mutually constitutive. And if I am capable of undermining them incrementally, then undermining one component of the system result can result in the undermining of the next component of the system. And I think there's still a lot of work to be done on these, this particular feature of, of backsliding, the way in which the component pieces of backsliding are interrelated, how an attack on civil liberties or on the media affects the, um, the separation of powers, how that in turn affects uh, civil liberties and the integrity of the electoral system. But there's also, um, we think, a, an interesting social psychology of incrementalism. And this is the area where I think it's, it'd really be interesting to see some experimental research, which is that um, uh, the actions of the autocrat become normalized. And I know that anyone who lives in has lived in the United States or in Putin's Russia will know what I'm talking about. Masha Giesen talks about this in her fantastic work on, on the Putin system, that, that, that you get used to this process and you can't tell whether it's going on or not because disinformation is rampant. And so publics are disoriented. It's difficult to know, you know, is this really happening? I mean, this was a debate, again, referring to the United States, which we see in many of these backsliding cases. Is this going on? Um, Hungary, again, is an example. And even the European Union was unclear. At what point do we say that Orban is really dismantling Hungarian democracy? Well, it took a long time to figure that out. And by the time it was figured out, he had moved, 
the, the, the needle, he had moved the center of gravity in that system in a more authoritarian direction. But we were really struck, you know, in how long it often took these backsliding processes to unfold. You know, you think of Venezuela, for example, as being a country in which, you know, Chavez comes in and, you know, the, 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 the political system has fundamentally changed. But even in a case like Venezuela, it's not true. This is a country, these are just indicators of, you know, the repression of civil society groups, the integrity of the, of the electoral monitoring uh, system, the high court independence, the independence of the media. These are things that were declined in Venezuela over two decades. You know, they, this didn't happen all at once. And so there's something about incrementalism which we think is, um, you know, is really worth uh, considering. Uh, let me just conclude by, by raising a few issues for further debate and research. And the first thing I want to say is, you know, this is a short book uh, and we by no means have solved this problem. I mean, this is a very complicated issue. And, and I'm sure there are other causal factors that might come into play, but, but let, me, let me just um, uh, close by three, uh, you know, by, by raising three questions that we might, uh, you know, might have a discussion about. The first is, is whether um, backsliding is stable, so to speak, uh, or does it necessarily um, not only erode democracy, but lead to outright uh, autocratic rule? And here, you know, the, the, the news is kind of mixed. Um, because one thing that's really quite interesting here is if we look at, if we divide the cases, the 16 cases we look at, into those that began as liberal democracies and those that began as uh, electoral democracies, that is, that, that had a somewhat lower standard of democracy. You know, these are countries in which you had some electoral freedom, some checks and balances, but there weren't what we would call consolidated liberal democracies. It's interesting that, that among this group, at the time we wrote the book, none of the consolidated um, liberal democracies reverted to authoritarian rule. Now, I think that question, that might be challenged now by Poland. I mean, I think I would now say that Poland is probably an authoritarian regime. But notice that most of the middle income countries that started this backsliding process ended up as being authoritarian regimes. So there's a question here about can backsliding be stopped? I mean, what, what are the risks to, to the advanced industrial states? Can you get rebounds? Are we seeing a rebound now in the United States where the backsliding process is stopped? I would argue we are. But that may be more difficult in countries that are, are less uh, consolidated. The second area, which is, is something I'm, I'm conducting research on now myself uh, in other settings, is this question of the international context and the role that uh, external forces might play in the backsliding process. So we now have two authoritarian great powers, Russia and China. Uh, and they are exercising influence in their neighborhoods and beyond them. And there's a question about whether there's, they provide external supports for regimes which are engaged in backsliding, such as Orban um, in, in Hungary and the Polish case. Uh, and, and so, you know, we also want to look at, at international institutions, whether whether authoritarian international institutions are playing a role in this backsliding process of protecting uh, regimes that, are, that are, are sliding backwards. And, and then we also have to ask about the role that, that the, the core countries in the system play. If, if democracy in Europe, uh, the United States, and Japan, Korea is not seen as an attractive proposition, then obviously it makes it more difficult for defenders of democracy elsewhere to, uh, to, uh, to support it in the face of challenge. And then the final question, of course, and in, in some ways I think the most profound one, 
is, uh, and again, this is speaking as an American, is just, you know, the, the whole social psychology of democracy. You know, I think this is uh, probably one of the most significant policy issues to come out of these backsliding episodes, is, is whether democracy can survive in what might be called a post-truth world. Can you have democracy in a setting in which the competing parties just can't even agree on basic sets of facts? And what independent role might technology, uh, media, and disinformation in particular play in the erosion of democracy? I would say this last question is probably the, one of the most significant policy questions because obviously thinking about how to control social media um, and, and regulate social media uh, plays very importantly into the question of, of whether democracy itself uh, will survive. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but I just wanna thank all of you for joining me here today, those who are both sitting in the room now and who are watching online. And I hope that um, if you have thoughts on any of these things, you'll feel free to contact me. I'm always interested in talking about these ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Haggard, uh, for a presentation on such an important topic. So now let us invite comments uh, from our discussants. And why don't we go by alphabetical order? Um, so Professor Cho, uh, Professor Kim, and then Professor Nam. So first of all, Professor Cho, please. Okay. Really, I really enjoyed the book. And then also you presented wonderfully. And while I reading this book, I really, it is quite easy for me to follow up because I'd like to first to mention my background and I'm studying democracy and typically democracy in emerging democracies. And the, I'm more interested in African cases, but mm -hmm. I'm also interested in the political institution. So those the components actually when I read this book, you know, even though you, you categorize the democracy backsliding, but most of the, your, the, you know, the theoretical framework actually well fit for many African emerging democracy or young democracy right now, except one. That is the, you know, I'd like to start the, my questions or comments on uh, this book. And first one is, you know, political polarizations. I think that is a very, you know, fundamental the beginning of your book, right? And then many, you know, existing democracy and younger democracy right now facing those uh, political polarizations. And then you mentioned, you specifically dis describe, you know, what is the origins of the political polarization. And you mentioned, and the socioeconomic inequality will be one of the resources. And then social structures, as you mentioned, the ethnicity or religious, etc. And when I read those foundation, I also would like to raise some question. How about the political institution? More broadly, how about the regime? So we don't, I mean, maybe, I'm not good at the many authoritarian regime, but do you think any authoritarianism has a political polarization? You know, I don't think so. And you, you mentioned at the last, you know, you raised also questions about the roles of the two author authoritarian regime like the China, also Russia. And so what I'm, what I'm asking, you know, whether this political polarization is because of democracy, you know, because democracy allowed, you know, competitions and participations, I said those are very key components of democracy. Because the regime allowed competitions, and it means the political elite can mobilize the, their supporters. So this political polarization is due because of the democracy. So in a, and also if that is the case, then how about you know because I'm interested in the political institutions and you know how about the government types? So usually. Among those 16 cases, majority of them are 
having a presidential system, right? Usually those presidential system, unlike the United States, many emerging democracy, power of the president, the degree of the power of the president is very strong. So, you know, whether those the political polarization is more occurred under the presidential system or parliamentary system, have you thought about those the issues? So I think, you know, maybe you can, you know, elaborate, you know, existing your the socioeconomic origins and cultural or the social structure origin, but also as a you know, origin for the political polarization, I would like you to think about whether the regime itself or whether within the democracy, is there any government type also actually can contribute uprising those political polarizations. So that is the, my first question I would like to raise. And the second one, I know, I'd like, you know, again, you know, those the scenario, those the, you know, sequences in, in your the theoretical framework, again, most of them actually very familiar to me when I studying many the African young democracy. So unlike the, those the, you know, the 16 cases, except the Zambia, as you know, in African continent, actually many of the country go through the democratic transition in mid 1990s. And that was very surprising. It is certainly, you can see a number of the electoral democracy in African continent, typically the sub-Saharan African countries uprising. So among 48 countries, the maximum number, if you count those the electoral democracy, the maximum number was about the, you know, 28 or 29th. So actually majority of the, those sub-Saharan African country go through the democratic tradition and then they regularly held multi-party elections. However, as you imagine, as you describe, you know, there is not many cases go through the power alternation or power turnover. So those elite, those the political party have been ruled under authoritarianism and they introduced the multi-party elections, but they already have their own network and their resources. And also, as you know, because those young democracy, typically opposition party is very weak. So the ruling party always can dominate it. even resources and they can mobilize, they can network, they can even using the bureaucratic network, as well as they have resources, they can easily beat those opposition parties and they can easily win those the majority seat in the legislatures. And even as you know, maybe, you know, Zambia was not successful, but uh, like, like uh, Uganda or, you know, some Rwanda, they was successfully to changing their constitution. You know, they, they first when they, they introduced multi-party election, they have a two turnover limit. But as time goes on, <laughs> you know, they get rid of the, those the limit for the first presidents. So, you know, those uh, sequences I can easily see from many of those, uh, you know, in electoral democracy in Africa. So according to your theories or the, you know, there is no bright futures <laughs> in Africa. I know that is the case. That is the case. But, but you know, like uh, even you didn't mention it. So you, you raised the question whether it is the democratic reason Erosion should it, it, it be stable or not? But from my perspective, you know, even among African countries, there is a, like a Ghana. I think I like the Ghana because they they go through the democratic transition, democratic transition, and even until now they have a three times of power turnover. So there is some good cases in Africa. Still, we we need to figure it out what make those the good cases instead of you know just you as you mentioned i mean this is very you know clever and bright uh, warning about uh, for typically for the young democracy so they go through the democratic transition and people are very happy with that but right now as you mentioned those political elite or the you know ruling party they really using this mechanism for they're consolidating their power instead of the consolidating their democracy. So I think in that case, is, this is very, you know, sightful, you know, 
the warning for like myself to studying the young democracy in in Africa. But you know, I, my second question would be related with another the government type. So through the mechanism, you know, the you know this among these sixteen cases, many of them are presidential system. And but having a parliamentary system, you know, the presidential system mechanically actually come up with a divided government. It is possible under the the presidential system. But as you mentioned, those the ruling party actually can mobilize the supporters. They can occupy the majority seat in the parliament. But you know, the parliamentary system it is mechanically you know much much easier for the ruling party to occupy the majority seat because the executive government depends on majority support from the legislative branches. So have you thought about this the you know the incremental processing much easier for the young democracy or democracy have a parliamentary system instead of the presidential system because of the check and balance mechanism working differently between these two governments. And also, and you know, the last one, you know, I totally agree with you because, you know, right now the China, actually if you look at, you know, because I'm studying African young democracy and then I look at the you know, newspaper in Africa, really Chinese government really mobilized, you know, African people, you know, their system is much superior <laughs> to the United States, et cetera. So right now, really, in, in typically in those marginal reason in the cold, like uh, African cases, you know, the Chinese government actually really put a lot of resources to bring their model to those the developing countries who struggle with it economically. I think that is a really big concern for me and we have to really considering about the futures of the, those young democracy in many the marginalized area. Okay, I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Oh, great questions, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Do you, yeah. oh, do you yes. Do you want me to respond to, uh, to each briefly or? Uh, uh, why do don't we present? go over with the comments first and then um, get back to you? What about that? I, okay, it's going to be a long list. I'll try to keep. I'll try to keep track. <laughs> okay, um, so then uh, Professor Kim Nam Gyu, please. Yes. Okay. So can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So. Okay, thank you for your presentation. So I enjoy a lot your presentation and your book. And to be honest, actually I'm a huge fan of your recent books and articles on democratic transitions, breakdown, and this one, backsliding. Yeah. So i like to begin with what I like about this book. So I think this is a really well-written book. So with, as I'm reading, every time I found myself with a question, that issue was immediately address later. Also, I found that this book surveys very well classic studies on democratic breakdown. At the same time, it draws on very recent studies on democratic backsliding and political polarization. Also, it presents a very clear and persuasive explanation of democratic backsliding. So particularly, I agree that the incremental nature of backsliding has significant causal effects on the acceleration of backsliding. And also, I agree with that controlling legislature is a key step in the process of backsliding. Also, methodolo methodolo methodologically, it adopts right, post-tracing method, causal process observation, and try to identify intervening causal mechanism from antecedent condition to backsliding. So to do so, it first identify, right, so full, entire universe of backsliding cases and check whether the causal mechanism proposed by authors actually exists in the case. Right? So this is very different from other qualitative study sampling certain cases and focusing on them. So given that the dependent variable backsliding is a rare event, it is I think very useful strategy to analyze it. Also 
I found that uh, this book has additional methodological strength. So I think this book illustrates very well how scholars can use quantitative cross-national data for case studies. So less uh, strength of this book I found is that it provides not only a full list of backsliding cases, but also case, case narratives supported by discrete statistics in the appendix. I think the appendix is really great resource for scholars and students who are interested in backsliding phenomena. And I have uh, three or four questions after this, uh, reading this book. So first one is, uh, so I'm wondering about how you think about the role of popular protest in stopping democratic backsliding. So in many cases, institutional constraint onto leaders fail to protect democracy. Even US case shows not only the strength of institutional checks, but also their weakness. So I think this is consistent with Barry Weingast's argument. Right? So in his famous 1997 APSR article, he emphasized that for democracy and the rule of law to be self-enforcing, citizens should coordinate right, their reaction, their protest against anti-democratic behavior of leaders. So only when citizens coordinate their reaction, they can discourage leaders from violating their rights. So having said that, I also understand both the context of high polarization and the incremental nature of backsliding make coordination among citizens more difficult. Nonetheless, I think, or I guess, mass mobilization might be the last resort to protect democracy against autocrats who led backsliding. So I'd like to ask what you think about the role of mass protest in stopping or slowing down democratic backsliding. And this point also related to a more general question. So this book tried to survey the process of democratic backsliding, thus it does not attempt to explain right, what can prevent the occurrence of democratic backsliding or slow down or stop ongoing backsliding process. But well, there might be like, some factors that can prevent or stop backsliding. So if you have any idea about these potential factors, so please your thoughts with us. Uh, my second comment is uh, kind of related to Professor George's comment. So the book briefly addressed the, the effect of political institutional arrangements such as government tie and electoral system. So I wonder whether a certain type of insti institutional setup or arrangement is more prone to backsliding. So for example, the books mention the potential effect of government types on the election of autocrats and their legislative support. But it didn't give full consideration of how pre presidentialism might affect the, the uh, degree of political polarization and executive aggrandizement. So I'm not expert on government type presidentialism or parliamentarism, but I guess that maybe presidential democracy might be more prone to political polarization or emergence of populism and the concentration of executive power. So of course, my US case is characterized by strong check and balance separation of power. But many presidential democracy display, right? The winner takes all politics. Separation power does not work well. So some presidentialism allow institutionally strong president. So I think these factors help the concentration of executive power. In addition, presidentialism is more likely to allow political outsiders to seize political power. So, uh, there might be uh, some association between presidentialism and populism, even though both presidentialism and parliamentarism exist in backsliding cases. So I'd like to know, so what you think about this association between presidentialism and backsliding 
Uh, last one is about the uh, empirical issue. So I'd like to ask you about the measure of uh, polarization. So actually, I thought about similar project that examine the relationship between political polarization and backsliding. So one of my uh, important puzzle to me uh, was, so how to measure empirically political polarization at the country level, right? So you utilize Redem's digital society, uh, society project data set. Well, I, like, I wonder, uh, maybe have you thought about other methods of measuring polarization at the country level? Uh, maybe have you considered using in, uh, individual level survey data or party level data? So I wonder also why you chose right, to use the VDEMS measure of polarization. Yeah, that's all. So thank you again for your presentation. Again, and just terrific comments. And I'll have I'll have something to say about all of it. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Kim. Then uh, Professor Nam, please. Okay, so thank you, thank you for your presentation. And first of all, I really enjoyed reading your book and enjoyed your presentation. Yes, this book was great, and I think this book shows a clear picture of the democratic backsliding. And I think this book also combined in depth theoretical explanation with uh, excellent case studies. But as a discussion, as a discussion, I will make a, a several comments and so questions. Um, I understand the dem uh, democratic backsliding process has largely three stages. So first, it begins with so polarization, and then the elected so government have control over the race ratio, and finally they demolish the democratic institutions and democratic norms. I think it is uh, theoretically very clear and simple. And these three stages of backsliding uh, make me easily understand the complex causal process of backsliding. And you did a case study on several countries, backsliding uh, countries, such as uh, uh, Brazil, Poland, and United States. Uh, but uh, to show how their politics and how their society became uh, polarized. But I think so each backsliding cases has somewhat uh, different stories regarding polarizations. I think uh, in Brazil, economic crisis brought about polarization. But in Poland, the political party called the PIS played an important role. So polarizing society and politics. And I think United States has more complicated story of polarization because so racial or so uh, cultural conflict were combined with economic difficulty or inequality. So, um, uh, so I know the common precondition of backsliding, it is a, a so polarization, but I understand democracies can face the risk of polarization in a variety of different ways. So, so I wondering, and I wanted to ask you, so what is the so main trigger of polarization and what is the common independent variable of polarization? Yes, we, we expected um, if our democracy uh, experiences uh, polarization, we can expect that democracy uh, to be ready to break down. But we, it is very difficult to expect when uh, a, a country will be polarized soon, okay? And, and, I also, and I also understand your book argued once polarization occurs, so autographs emerge and they mobilize their so, supporter and so demonize the uh, uh, opposition and they finally destroy the democratic institution and norms, so bit by bit, but uh, without so, any resistance from the civil society. So I think in your book, the democratic backsliding is mainly driven by the duly elected so, government. So I understand duly elected government, so they are the main actor in, in backsliding process. So they can weaken horizontal checks on the uh, executive and they can weed out the, uh, the electoral system uh, finally. So, so while uh, democratic institution is damaged by duly elected government, uh, 
So where is the civil society? And well, so your case studies uh, uh, in your book that mentions what the civil society was doing, but a uh, response of the civil society to, to democratic uh, regress. So it was not a big deal in your argument, in your, in your case study. Uh, so I, I don't know whether my understanding is correct or not, but I think this book assumed that civil society uh, is already softened or so weakened after so polarization. Um, so, and the case study considered the civil society as a, a passive actor and they just silenced concerning the democratic uh, the backsliding. But I think civil society, they can play an important role in monitoring corruption, president, president elections, and protesting authoritarian government and resisting democratic backsliding. Um, and this book argues also the uh, social psychological mechanisms come into play in the last stage. So incremental process of democratic backsliding. And so the public, so they became uh, irrational and they are easily deceived by propaganda or social media controlled by the authoritarian government. And they were acclimated to new undemocratic norms and, and authoritarian rules. So that means does the public uh, elect or support backsliders because they have uh, diminished their support for a democracy or or the public has still have still maintain their support for a democracy, and they try to resist a democratic backsliding. But is the public or their resistance uh, opposed opposed by uh, authoritarian government during the backsliding process? I, I ask this question because this book said uh, autocratic government they are a master of propaganda and a master of uh, polarization and they can manipulate uh, citizens' so preference and citizens' support for a democracy. But yes, I know uh, social um, psychological mechanisms so have a key role to play in the, in the incremental process of backsliding. But I think it is a different question. And I think I, so this book needs to show the public they are really, uh, their preference is really damaged by uh, the elected government, duly elected government. But this book just focused on how the duly elected government um, so make the public insensible to, to undemocratic institution and authoritarian norms. So even though authoritarian government or uh, autocratic readers, they try to incrementally manipulate uh, citizens' preference or citizens' support for a democracy, so using social media or propaganda, the public may, uh, I think, public may still have a potential passion for a democracy. So, so if their country so really fall back into fully authoritarian government, the public and the people, they may have, they may regain passion for a democracy and they may begin to resist democratic backsliding and uh, authoritarian regime. So yeah, well, this book shows the extent of backsliding and extent of polarization, but at the country level, but it is still questionable whether the public and their preference for democracy is really damaged by the duly elected government. So I think this book needs to show the public does not, they do not love democratic value anymore so at the individual level. And I think this showed the, uh, whether uh, so, uh, social psychological mechanism really work or not. And in, in conclusion, uh, this book so unfortunately suggested a gloomy perspective for the future of democracy. Um, so you worried about kind of a spillover effect of uh, rising authoritarian powers such as uh, China and Russia. And you also mentioned uh, the United States so has no longer spread uh, the democratic values around the world, especially during the Trump era. So I think the uh, democratic backsliding is not only indigenous exercise, it is also acceler 
accelerated by exogenous, exogenous uh, uh, factors. So backsliding can be understood by in, in, uh, international context. So that means it seems to be very, very difficult to stop the global uh, so backsliding phenomenon. Uh, but I hope and I believe so democracies, especially long-standing democracies, they have so resilience and they can uh, cope with uh, the challenges. They can uh, crisis, they can recover from the crisis and they finally thrive again. And you, and also it's the Biden. So Biden took the office and the Biden administration is expected to, to return to the liberal spirit of democracy and to, to demonstrate uh, global resonance of democratic value and, and, and norms. So I want and I expect um, uh, more uh, optimistic perspective on the future of democracy from you. So do you think uh, there is any possibility or uh, any ways to, to make uh, backsliding countries bounce back? So that is my question. Last question. Okay, thank you. Boy, this is a tough audience. They're 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 terrific. Uh, they're terrific questions, and there are just so many of them. I I I, I hardly know where to start. I think I'll, I might take them in reverse order and kind of group some of the questions together because um, Yunmin Nam's last intervention, you know, touches on this whole question of civil society and it provides me an opportunity to, to, um, to talk about some issues we struggled with in, in doing the project. And so several of you raised this question of, of civil society and the role that civil society plays. And I think Yun Min suggested, well, you know, you portray a civil society as, as passive. Um, I, I don't think that's our intention because remember, the, the, the distinctive feature of backsliding first and foremost is that it's a demand driven phenomenon. It has to be because because it's defined as a setting in which publics are voting for political candidates who are promising backsliding. So, so civil society in some ways is, is a piece of this discussion from the beginning because you've got voters who are willing to vote for politicians who are promising this majoritarian approach to politics. So I think, I think that, that what is not as clear in this book as it could be is that we don't try to resolve the question of whether polarization is an elite or mass phenomenon. You know, it's, it's clearly both. You know, publics are divided and elites are divided. And, and the elites divide the publics and the publics divide the elites. And I don't think we're gonna solve that, that question you know, fully, certainly not in this book. But I have to say that some of those like, um, like Mo Fiorini in the United States who claims that polarization is solely an elite phenomenon, I just don't think that's correct. I mean, the publics in the United States are also divided. And you admit that gets to another point you made is they're divided about democracy. They're divided about democracy. Because remember, you know, the, the concept of polarization means that there are those that are going to see the autocrat as a threat and are going to try to push back. So, so the public is not uniformly, you know, fooled by this process. I mean, the polarization extends to divisions over whether backsliding is going on, in fact. You know, so, so I, I think we have to, from the beginning, think of civil society as itself divided and polarized into those that are more amenable to autocratic solutions and those that are less amenable to autocratic solutions. And so then the question becomes, you know, how does that balance between those two contending forces play out in different settings? And can civil society reassert itself um, as, um, I think it was, 
I think it was Yun. Um, it was Nam Q who made this point. You know, can civil society reassert itself as a sort of check on this autocratic behavior? So I'm, I'm not sure I'm doing a good job at answering your question, but I think the important thing to, to keep in mind is that civil society is heterogeneous on these autocrats. You know, they do face opposition. They don't have 100% of people aren't supporting President Trump in the United States because the, the system is polarized. That's a defining feature. There are people who are as strongly anti-Trump as there are people who are, who are pro-Trump, right? Now, let me, uh, let me turn to a very interesting set of questions that, that come out of, um, of uh, Yun Min's intervention and Nam Gyu's intervention, which is this whole question of, of whether popular protest acts as a check. And I think this is going to be a big area of future research because, because I just really don't know the answer to this question. Um, you know, on the one hand, you could say, yes, you know, that public protest is, is sort of the last resort against autocratic behavior. You know, look at developments in Belarus, you know, if you can't get people on the street, then, then you know, the autocrat will prevail. But, but, you know, it's interesting to see how these autocrats also exploit protest as an excuse for tightening autocratic control, right? So, so again, I'm using a lot of American examples, but we could replicate them. You know, I mean, the Trump administration during the summer of 2020 was focused on BLM, on Black Lives Matter. And was saying, you know, this is where the threat is coming from in this society. It's coming from these protesters. And so, so the effects of protest are, are sort of ambiguous. I mean, you know, or take, take another example, you know, Putin's Russia. You know, the existence of protest is an excuse for, for tougher interventions and crackdowns. And so there's, there, there, there are sort of conflicting dynamics there of whether protest can act as a check or whether autocrats can exploit protest for the purpose of continuing in their, in their march to try to uh, restrict the political sphere. Um, let me take up another you know, very interesting question. I don't want to monopolize. I'd really like to have more of, of a discussion. But let me take up another question, which is this question of, of whether um, institutions matter in the sense of where, whether um, you know, it's more possible for presidents or you know, parliamentary systems to, to backslide. And I thought it was interesting because, because even though you were raising, uh, several of you raised this question of whether presidential systems might be more prone to backsliding, you actually presented arguments that suggested it could be the other way. Because of course, in a, in a Westminster um, kind of uh, system, um, you, you've got a, a sort of fusion of the executive and legislative functions, which you would think would be more dangerous. While in a presidential system, you at least have the potential for legislatures to act as a check. And again, to use American examples, it's quite interesting that, you know, the legislature in the United States was certainly supported Trump, the Republican legislature, you know, prior to 2018, certainly supported Trump. But the but American Congress was not going to transfer more power to President Trump. Uh, I mean, they were very testy about their own prerogatives and believed, you know, in in the integrity of, of congressional powers. So they certainly went along on such issues of appointments, but you didn't, you would never see an American Congress voting to suspend term limits, for example, or to you know, transfer more powers directly to the executive. You know, they, even Republicans wanted to maintain their, their prerogatives. So I, I, I'm, I'm agnostic on this. I mean, I think it's a good um, issue for future research, whether, whether institutions matter. But I'll just point out that, that even though we don't do a systematic econometric analysis of this, there's certainly both types of systems included in this sample. 
because Poland, Hungary, Ukraine at various times, Turkey initially, these were all parliamentary systems initially, or, or systems in which the, the president was, you know, a weak presidency. Um, now, it is interesting that, that in the Turkish system, they transitioned from a parliamentary to a presidential system, but the backsliding phenomena there started under parliamentary auspices. And I, can, I, can, I think I can tell stories about how parliamentary systems also have checks. I mean, even in a Westminster system like the United Kingdom, there's certainly a variety of institutionalized checks from the backbenchers within the party to the strength of judicial institutions and just norms that you might think would check backsliding. But boy, you know, I mean, Britain is a potential case um, where the divisions over Brexit suggested backsliding like processes under, under um, Boris Johnson. I mean, there are just so many good questions here. I, I, I'm not ignoring your question because I, I don't think it's important. I've got whole lists of, of comments, but again, I think it might be useful to, to have more of a discussion. But let me come back to um, some things that Juan been raised, which is, is, is how to think about this in, in relationship to broader processes of authoritarian regress. And let me just again underline, you know, this, this important point, which is the systems we're talking about here are not systems that are only, you know, limited, are competitive authoritarian to begin with. If you can figure out um, one then a, a way in which we can link this to competitive authoritarianism, then maybe we should write it up and, and produce something on that. But, but, you know, these are, you know, the, the distinctive feature of, of these backsliding cases is exactly that they, that it's, it's elected, dem, it's elected, duly elected, fairly elected democratic leaders that are leading this charge. And so I think that in the African cases, those that did not cross some democratic threshold, you know, I mean, Ghana may be at risk in the future of this, but if you're talking about the competitive authoritarian systems, those are systems in which the executive already has levers of power that tilt the balance against, you know, the possibilities that democratic forces would be able to operate. And so I think that's, again, a, a somewhat different, you know, set of issues. And the concern, I think, um, for the African cases are other regions where we haven't seen um, uh, backsliding yet is that if those democracies that, if those countries in Africa that have democratized were to become polarized, then would there be this kind of risk? And, and that um, allows me to raise, you know, a last question partly for you, because I, I know I haven't asked her all these questions, we can come back to them. But you know, is how do you think about a country such as Korea? Because, you know, Korea clearly is a, de a democratic country. It is becoming more polarized. It seems to be becoming more polarized. And is there a risk that that polarization could uh, empower executives to exploit, as Yun Min points out, you know, a strong executive for the purpose of going after political enemies? And I think the answer to that in part is that this has partly occurred in Korea, you know, to at least some extent. And, and it's certainly a debate in Korea now about whether these kinds of forces could be, could be in play there, either in the past, in the present, or, or into the future. Um, I realize there is one last question which I really have to, to address, and it has to do with these sources of, of polarization. I think Yunmin quite rightly raised this, and so I want to come back to him on this. And that is, uh, you know, the question of whether there is a kind of single taproot, um, to use Hobbes, Hobson's term, you know, whether there's a kind of common source of polarization. And I think the conclusion we came to is we didn't want to go there because we didn't see it in the world. I mean, we really saw, you know, these different sources of polarization. And so it could, in some cases, be economic inequality that gets mobilized. Um, it could be 
uh, ethnicity. It could be the difference between cosmopolitans and nationalists. It could be religious in the case of a, a country like Turkey, uh, or even to some extent in Poland and Hungary. But I think what we're arguing is that the sources of the polarization are, are less significant than the fact of polarization. You know, that this can come from many sources. You've got right populists who are mobilizing ethnic and anti-cosmopolitan grievances. You've got left populists who are mobilizing economic resentments. And that happened in Greece. It happened in the United States. It happened, you know, in a number of places. Um, but it's not the sources that matter so much as it is that you view your political rivals as enemies that you really get these sharp binaries where you're either one of us or you're one of them. And if you have a polity where you have those kinds of very sharp divisions, then you're, you're willing to tolerate um, these kinds of backsliding processes because you think that the autocrat is actually protecting you from your enemies. They're protecting you from your enemies. And, and that's, that's really the terrain on which, you know, democratic politics gets very dangerous when you perceive of your political adversaries, not as someone like you, who's just trying to do the best they can in a setting where, you're diff where your preferences diverge, but as someone who really is outside, you know, and is trying to destroy the system from within. And, and that's, that's when, um, you know, democratic politics gets uh, dangerous. I, so I think I'll stop. I'm just going to um, turn on my light here so that I can see you better. But um, I, I can hear you. So please, uh, uh, Juyun, why don't you lead us? Yes, sure. Um, thank you. Um, well, uh, why don't we go for the second round of questions and answer. Um, first, uh, if you have any follow-up questions or comments, um, three discussants will have the chance first, and then I will collect questions from the floor. Um, and then let's uh, ask Professor Hager to answer our questions. Right. So, and can I, can I just make a, a sure. suggestion about procedure? Sure. I, if, if I did not answer your question, it's, it's not because it wasn't a good question. I just didn't want to do all the talking. So if you ask a question before, which you feel I didn't answer, then just briefly restate the question and I'll, I'll come back to it because you know, I want to have this uh, kind of exchange to the extent we can. Yes, of course. Um, any follow-up questions or comments, um, including um, the case of South Korea? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, okay, let me, because you know, even the Hegard already includes in his book about the rising those authoritarian countries like China and Russia. But oh yeah, That's I'd like idea. to you know again you know what is your perspective you know on the impact of the China on this the democratic backsliding and we are coming back to kind of the new Cold War era. What do you think? Ripley, thank you. Yeah, well, I, I have a paper which uh, you know I've had a hard time getting published, but I'll I'll I'll, cir I'll circulate an older version of it if anyone is interested. But with a graduate student named Christina Cordiero, we've done some econometric work where we're basically looking at whether the membership in autocratic authoritarian institutions that is international institutions which are dominated by um, uh, authoritarian governments, whether that has an effect on political liberalization and the likelihood that you will democratize. And we find that it does, it has an adverse effect. So if you're a member of a, an autocratic IO, a regional international organization, whether it be in, um, in the Middle East or in Africa or increasingly in Central Asia, then the prospects for you democratizing go down. So, so I, you know, we have, you know, we have some, uh, a little bit of econometric evidence in this paper for this one proposition. 
but I think that the 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 tools of influence here are much broader than just through these um, regional and international organizations like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, because they also extend to things like the BRI and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And I don't know what the discourse is in South Korea on the BRI, but it's it's gotten much more alarmist in the United States and Western Europe over the last just two years, because there is a perception that the BRI can be used and, and, and particular investments that are undertaken by the BRI, including in things like media and telecommunications and Chinese internet firms you know, that are investing very widely, that these are actually facilitators of either authoritarian rule or potentially backsliding. You know, to go back to Wan Bin, there are points at which these two sets of arguments converge. And, um, you know, clearly Putin has tried to build connections with and support the governments in Poland and, and Hungary, you know, as a way of kind of dividing the European Union. And we see, we see that these uh, international organizations are operating in Africa. Um, with the purpose of supporting, you know, semi-democratic or competitive authoritarian regimes to to uh, shore up autocratic regimes there, and you know, I think the the most interesting place to look at this uh, going forward is going to be in in the BRI, you know, in the in the whole uh, area to China's west, where it's clearly seeking to stabilize. Uh, Central Asia in a way to prevent color revolutions from from um, from recurring as they did in Georgia and Ukraine. So, so I think I think this is I think this is going to be a major area of research going forward. And and again to to put a little Korean spin on this, you know, when when um, President Moon came to to uh, to to Washington for what I thought was a very successful summit overall this whole issue of Korea standing for values and whether it would um, make value-oriented statements uh, in support of democracy, um, how its um, Southern initiative would link with what the United States was trying to do in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, that these kinds of issues are, are very much alive. Any further comments, follow-up comments from Professor Kim or Nam? No? Um, then um, let's open it up uh, to the floor. Uh, Professor Huang Chun Lee, um, do you have any questions, comments? Oh, yes, Professor Huang. Uh, thanks a lot for your wonderful uh, the presentation and the discussion uh, by other the commentators. And then actually, like uh, Professor Kim nam -Guru, I'm a great fan of your the books and arguments, but not in this field, but in North Korea and international relations because I study uh, the IL and the North Korea's foreign policy. So I would like to ask you a question uh, that is related to the, your previous, you know, the connection between your previous book that you authored with uh, Marcus Knowledge, the hard target with this book, then you, in your previous previous book, hard target, you talked about, uh, you mentioned about the international, you know, that economic uh, sanctions and the inducement on North Korea, like the, you know, North Korea is also like the authoritarian and dictatorship regime, although it's not like the, the backsliding uh, country. So I, my question is a uh, simple and um, uh, what is the, the, the international effect uh, on uh, the backsliding uh, countries? Although, you know, that the political leaders in the backsliding countries are less likely to give up their the power, you know, and their grip on uh, power. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I think there is some kind of implication that uh, the, you know, that the international effect on ex external, you know, the effect on the, uh, the domestic uh, backsliding, uh, backsliding effect in those, uh, the, uh, the countries. Although, the, you know, I, I know that you mentioned about the international context of uh, the, the backsliding, uh, like the great powers of China and Russia, but this is a, uh, the, a different one because the, maybe the international, uh, the effect of, on the backsliding. 
Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, this, this, is, this is a really interesting question, you know, of not only, you know, so, so the way that the question was originally posed by one bin, as I understood it, was the whole question of whether the international environment is becoming more conducive for backsliding to occur, that is more permissive. But what Jiwan is arguing, as I understand it, is he's asking the opposite question, which is what happens in a context where you have either more backsliding countries or just more authoritarian countries. And I think that I think that it contributes to a kind of global strategic polarization, because because countries that are autocratic have potential allies and will realign with other authoritarian countries. And and you know I, I I'm a little skeptical of the idea of a coalition of democracies. Um, but, but, you know, it really is true that if, if the United States, Western Europe, uh, Korea, Japan are standing up more strongly for human rights and are conducting a diplomacy which to some extent targets and tries to weaken autocratic countries or at least reverse their autocratic practices, then naturally this incentivizes those countries to seek support from other autocracies. And so, so um, you know, this is a, I'm currently looking at the 1930s. I have a paper about, you know, how that I'm working on. Uh, I have a draft about, you know, how the United States looked at this question of democracy and autocracy in the 1920s and 30s, as you saw this wave of authoritarian reversals. And it is interesting that over time, this idea that world politics, that the cleavages in world politics fell along regime type lines became more and more pronounced. Now, is this a good idea? Well, that's where I become a little bit more of a realist and less, than a, that less of a liberal, because I'm not sure it really is a good idea if we're seeing a world politics through a regime type lens because the United States has to um, interact pragmatically with countries that are autocratic, including with China. And if we're seeing the world divided along regime type, uh, uh, through a regime type lens, it may contribute to the hardening of these kind of cleavages and the reemergence of a Cold War setting to a greater extent than I might prefer. So I'm a Democrat, but you know, liberals have to interact with illiberal countries in a productive way. And, and in, some, in some cases, um, you know, pushing the human rights agenda to the fore, and my South Korean colleagues will know exactly what I'm talking about, may or may not be the most productive thing to do, honestly. I mean, I personally think that South Koreans should be able to, you know, South Korean NGOs that are human rights organizations should have the freedom to speak. But I can certainly imagine why President Moon or President No or Kim Dae Jung before him doesn't have an interest in putting human rights at the top of the agenda in, in interacting with, with the North Korea. Did, am, I, am I making sense, Ji Yeah. Thank you, definitely. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great. Um, if I may, I would like to throw in some questions as well. Um, sure. I'm, not an, I'm not an expert on democracy or democratic transition at all, uh, but reading your book, which actually, by the way, uh, fascinating, um, I constantly had questions regarding the definition and the implications of the concept of backsliding, actually. Right. So first, uh, regarding the definition of backsliding, um, I have some worries about the conceptual stretch and uh, equivalence between cases. Um, don't get me wrong, I totally share your concerns about the threat even to the most advanced democracies, uh, including the US. But um, I'm, I'm not really sure if we can throw in the US or the uh, Western European countries and 
for example, the eight cases that eventually declined into competitive authoritarianism into a same category of backsliding. Mm -hmm. um, because if so, I mean, the question is, how can we distinguish between um, the ebb and flow, normal ebb and flow um, in political progress or democracy and backsliding? because political progress is not a linear process, right? You can sometimes take two steps back and one step forward. Fluctuations take place everywhere. So if, if it, it's true that we are looking at this phenomena that you call as backsliding, but um, are some of them simply um, the ebb and flow uh, of the democracy or political process? Uh, of course, uh, I noticed that uh, you emphasize that it is mistaken to think that nothing much has ultimately changed in the US. Uh, I kind of agree, but at the same time, um, for example, um, you call those elected, duly elected uh, leaders as autocrats um, in the cases, of course, you analyze. Um, but if you call Trump uh, an autocrat, <laughs> Uh, and both Stalin and um, Trump can fall into the category of uh, autocrats. Yeah. I mean, what's the use of the concept autocrat? <laughs> that, that, that's my first question, right? Conceptual stretching and the right. equivalence uh, between cases. Right. And my second question is about the implications of this concept um, backsliding. Um, I really appreciate uh, your effort uh, put um, in the first uh, part of your book, uh, defining uh, the concept of backsliding, the defining characteristics of backsliding. I love them. But all these key characteristics of backsliding, they are kind of ex post facto depictions of the phenomena we are observing today. So uh, if this backsliding has this phenomena of backsliding have certain characteristics, key characteristics that you have already explained very well. Why these particular characteristics at this particular time? And what would be the analytic importance of these key characteristics to us political scientists who are interested in democracy and um, backsliding phenomena? These two will be my questions. Yeah, yeah this is, these are these are great questions and and, and tough ones. So, so let me um, let me address um, let me address your first question, which I think is related to your second one by by sharing my screen again, if I could, and and showing you some pictures because I think it'll help it'll help um, uh, you know, you know cl maybe not maybe not answer your question but clarify how we dealt with it right. So. So notice, so these are thumbnails of all of the cases. Look at the United States, right? I mean, for, for, for most of this period, this, this line, you know, these, these liberal, these, you know, electoral democracy scores, these are liberal democracy scores, I think, um, you know, are just, it's just sort of flat, right? There isn't very much change. And then you get this statistically significant regress, which is very small in this case, right? And doesn't mean that the, the United States is no longer a liberal democracy. But then you've got other cases like Venezuela was considered for, for decades a relatively consolidated emerging country democracy. And then it starts this process, but then it just continues, right? And so, so clearly, you know, backsliding processes don't necessarily follow the same path, nor do they end in the same place. And I suspect when you look at VDEM data going forward, there's likely to be a bounce back here. And we see other cases like Ecuador, for example, where Correa ultimately was forced from office and, you know, the regime kind of bounce back and we've got North Macedonia where we also had an autocrat who was voted out of office and someone else was put back in. So, so I don't think we're, we're saying that there's any, you know, tendency for this process to end in the same place. Um, and when we say that someone is an autocrat, I think it's fair. I think your criticism is fair that, you know, Trump is not Stalin. 
but but what these what these autocratic leaders, maybe we should call them something like that, do have in common is they're willing to engage in what might be called reverse institutional engineering. They're seeking, and this gets to, you know, I think your second question, which is what the component dimensions of this process are. And we really go back to the kind of triad of what constitutes a liberal democracy, which is it, it has an electoral system with integrity. It has a certain um, element of guarantee of rights and particularly the core, uh, the core freedoms that are necessary for political freedoms, you know, the, the right to assembly, to petition, the media, freedom of speech. And then you've got this, um, you know, more complex component, which is horizontal checks, which is that, you know, executives are subject to some degree of check from the judiciary or from other independent agencies within the executive branch. And so, so I think that the, the concept of backsliding is, that, is not that all of these things erode in tandem, but that typically all of these simultaneously see some kind of erosion, you know, some sort of deterioration. And I think the reason why the concept is, is difficult to grapple with is exactly because you're not dealing with an obvious regime change. You're dealing with something which is more initially more incremental in scope. And even if these declines are sharper in Venezuela, you know, than they were in the United States, I mean, look at Brazil. I mean, if you push this forward, you know, Brazil would would be further along than we once thought, right? And um, again, I'm not sure I'm completely answering your question, but I, I think we're, I, all I guess I'm saying is that we're aware of the fact that the initiation of this process doesn't necessarily either start or end in the same place. And I think it's an open question about what the, and several of the of the people on the call raise this you know of what the political forces are which ultimately you know permit these systems to to bounce back okay thank you very much for your answers um yeah. i do I appreciate yeah, them actually but <laughs> i don't think that was a good answer but it was a good question i can tell you that great answers um any well, other oh Young one, did you? Professor Lee? Yeah, did you Professor have... Lee. Yeah. I think you're muted, Professor Lee. You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Actually, this wonderful talk and then uh, your presentation and discuss discussion seems to be flying me back into graduate seminar I took uh, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, compared to Columbus. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I have a one a simple, uh, maybe a, a question, maybe related or unrelated. That is about uh, my long held question about the separation of powers. And then that's a, a big story in your uh, backsliding uh, narratives and descriptions. And then that is um, okay. actually what is the basis or normative or logical basis uh, upon which we, we can claim that we have a separation of power when uh, Supreme Court justice or justice not democratically elected. <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, executive branches appoint, obviously we go through hearings and uh, with, uh, we, it requires congressional, you know, uh, sort of, you know, approval, but still they are appointed. And we have, we have a lot of politicking in Korea about uh, appointment of Supreme Court justice and justice. So I always uh, uh, think of uh, the question whether or not we really have uh, ever had good balance of separation of power, even in advanced democracies. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, so, boy. Well, I mean, so you know, that, how that... can you justify yeah. we really have separation of powers when, you, when we or executive branches appoint 
uh, Supreme Court justice. I don't know if that's related or unrelated, but that's my question. Boy, that's a Korea question. I mean, you know, <laughs> the prosecutor's office, I mean, you know, this is the, the whole issue of the reform of the prosecutorial power in Korea, of course, has been just a central question. Mm -hmm. and, and the potential abuse of the prosecutor's office because of the fact that it combines the power to investigate and indict. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have been following, you know, the reforms which President Moon has tried to introduce in that regard. But, but look, you know, I think I think the the answer to this question has to be pragmatic. You know, I mean, no one, including Madison, believed that you know the powers of these branches were going to be tightly separated. And I think it's in Federalist eighty two where he talks about the judiciary and and the fact that the judiciary is a weak branch and so forth. But I think we do have what might be called realist theories about why political opponents might want to agree on a certain neutral arbiter. And it's just simply because of the fact that you're in office today, but you may not be in office tomorrow. I mean, that, that, as simple as it sounds, that, that carries tremendous theoretical significance. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if you and I are political opponents, even if we're divided, I would prefer to have an independent, you know, judiciary mm -hmm. if I'm going to be out of office in the future. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are limits. I think there are practical limits to the extent to which um, competing parties in a democracy really want to see the judiciary fundamentally undermined, you know. And we're having this debate in the United States because there's, I think, the court you know, here, and, and I'm sure that there are similar debates in Korea and the Korean court is, do we run a risk of delegitimation if we're too closely mm -hmm. aligned? And I'm not talking about judges that are corrupt and have been indicted. I'm just talking about as an institution, does the judiciary run risk mm -hmm. if it's seen as basically being an instrument for, for partisan ends? So, um, you know, look, you know, there, there are a lot of details about the, the Korean case that I would actually like to discuss if you want to push them about how this issue has been, has been addressed there. But I don't, think, I don't think that anyone who believes in the separation of powers don't, you know, believes that these branches are completely independent. It's they're independent in a sense by, by a kind of, um, acquiescence or an acknowledgement that there's utility for both sides to maintaining you know these kind of checks mm -hmm. and i think the same could be said for legislative power frankly mm -hmm. i mean you know the legislature doesn't want an executive that's too strong and you know the, the executive doesn't want <laughs> uh, uh, an executive does the legislature doesn't want an executive too strong, and and, and you know the the executive has an interest in 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 freeing itself when it can, you know, from national assembly to take the Korean case uh, constraints. Right? I mean, Korea is a strange case because it you know has an unusually strong executive, mm -hmm. and so you know these issues of checks and balances there are quite. Are, are I think of a different order of magnitude than in, in the United States, even where you know the the Congress is very powerful, and you know is not going to just acquiesce to shifting power to the to the um, to the executive. But I should just note, you know, for those of you who who made the case that maybe maybe institutions matter here, I mean, you know, backbenchers in Fidesz were willing to grant Orban an incredible amount of power, despite the fact that it was a parliamentary system. You know, so, so I don't see, you know, a necessary connection there between um, the fundamental institutional form and, and the capacity for these guys to, uh, to, um, to do damage. I mean, you know, you can even make the case that in parliamentary systems, it's easier to control two of the branches. And interestingly, in both Hungary and Poland, one of the first signs of backsliding, to go back to Ju Yun's question, mm -hmm. were attacks on which branch? The judiciary. Mm -hmm. The judiciary. <laughs> because it was the, the branch which, you know, the parties didn't control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for yourself. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, I think I have to ask one last question. I think it's far uh, past your dinner time. You must be hungry. So sorry for that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm getting fed here. What are you talking about? <laughs> got a feast. You guys are, are, are feeding me. <laughs> well, I have a very broad question. You know, most of the viewers are political scientists in South Korea. So I want to ask about your view of the discipline of comparative politics in the United States, how your critical view of the uh, scholarly landscape of comparative politics there, because in IR, my field, there is strong criticism of, against the American trend of studying international relations, uh, the absence of theory, the death of IR theory in general, theory as a hypothesis, not really as a genuine theory. So is there any opinion uh, about your status? Oh boy, I mean, you know, that, you know, comparative <laughs> politics is such a diverse field because because, you know, I mean, here I am, we're talking to one bin, you know, and my student in Bakri is an Africanist, you know, Korea has now got the whole world, you know, it, it's, it's rise as a, as a significant middle, middle income power and its global reach means you're seeing um, comparative politics expand in, in South Korea. So you're, you're seeing similar kinds of processes. I'm going to answer your question by, um, by deflecting a little bit. I think one thing that concerns me, it's not, I'm not concerned about the development of method exactly. I think it's appropriate and I always try to urge my students to train themselves and, and acquire the skills they need, both quantitative and qualitative. But I think one thing that, that worries me a little bit about some strands of, um, of uh, North American social science, the political science, which is changing actually, I think it's changing for the positive, is, is encouraging graduate students and faculty to be engaged in, in substantive debates in the public arena. I mean, I, I, if I worry about one thing, it's not that people aren't doing good work or that it's too narrow. But it's more that I think we should be encouraged as social scientists to speak to, to issues of public policy. And I mean, you know, I think, I think for Koreans, this is much more natural. I think, I think many Korean social scientists, political scientists have always been engaged in politics, maybe too much. They're engaged in politics too much, too much drinking with their, with their, their bureaucratic friends, you know, rather than writing their articles. But I do think that there, in the United States, the risk is a little bit different, you know, that, that, that there's a lot of concern in both international relations and comparative politics that, that, um, that the academy, academic political science has drifted away from, from the political arena. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's surprising the extent to which people who are in the policy world rely so infrequently on what political scientists do. And I think it's partly because they, political scientists, myself included, are not necessarily good at communicating the value of what they do to someone who's a policymaker. And so I guess I worry more about that, you know, that, that if you're teaching your students or you're a junior faculty member, write your papers, get them in the SSCI journals, all those things you have to do, but don't be afraid of commenting on um, foreign policy issues or, um, that are uh, that your work speaks to, I think that's I think that's not something that should be avoided. I think it's an obligation of us, uh, obligation on us. Yeah. It's a great question, Chisholm. Great. Uh, we are uh, way past the time, <laughs> um, and uh, definitely this topic ignites the, the passion uh, inside us, uh, political scientists. And I would love to continue with the discussion, but I guess we have to let go of the audience. So let's at least wrap up this official part. Uh, we can continue uh, chatting afterwards. But um, thank you so much, Professor Haggard, uh, for sharing your insights and thoughts and your research with us. Uh, we greatly appreciate this chance to learn from you. Uh, and I think it's a lot of fun, you know, to me that that's, that's the, that's the real measure of, of a good conversation is you walk away feeling like you've learned something and you've also had some fun. So it's really good um, seeing those of you I know and meeting those of you I haven't. So thanks for having me.
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And thank you all the discussants for coming here today. Uh, and thank you for all the great comments. So um, we'll come back next month with uh, the third uh, book webinar and uh, meet you again then. Goodbye. Right. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you.